Now this next uh, part may seem a little bit odd um, to kind of examine, but basically, as we've seen with Cecil Rhodes, some Europeans claim they have the power and the right to take over parts of Africa because they are racially, that is, they understood to be biologically superior. And it may seem odd to spend time on this, um, perhaps, because it seems to us so strange, but there's a couple reasons why I want to do so. Uh, the first reason is that some of these ideas um, are still around, I think. There are a lot of people who look down unfortunately, um, on Africa, and who will basically argue that, well, Africa may have some issues or problems because in some particular way, Africans are inferior. And I've heard people uh, make this argument, and I think it's wrong. Uh, not simply do I think it's morally wrong, I think it's also factually wrong. Um, as a historian, I would argue, as we shall see, that um, there is uh, what we call historical contingency. Uh, we can understand it's kind of luck, in a sense, um, but basically, the, even though the African, uh, African nations, especially today, might face some difficulties, it's not because their civilizations are or people are somehow inferior to other human beings. And, and it seems odd to me that I have to say that, but I keep hearing people say uh, that somehow they are inferior. So I need to, I think, point out some problems with that and help us, uh, and that goes to the second point, is just to help us better understand how Africans responded to imperialism and how even though in the end most of Africa as we'll see will be colonized Africans were capable of mounting successful resistance against Europeans in many cases they were eventually overcome but it's key to understanding why and how they resisted and um, why it's wrong to think that somehow Africans are inferior um, we can we can answer and, and deal with those issues by looking at a couple of test cases, right? So the first test case we're going to look at to kind of challenge this claim is the Zulus, right? That's our first test case. So the Zulus were a group of people and are a group of people, I should say, in southern Africa. They uh, are named, in a sense, for their leader, a man named uh, Shaka Zulu. And he has a very, very complex history, but I just want to note that he was a very um, intelligent man and an innovator. He was willing to transform how uh, Zulus in particular made war that allowed him to conquer large amounts of territory and then administer them, right? So you can think of Shaka Zulu as a state builder, as a conqueror. Right? He's someone who's going to use military power to go out and conquer larger areas of Africa and establish his own state. So when he is uh, born, he's born into a civilization, a society that is focused on a kind of tribal level of government in which government's mostly based around family ties and things like that. But he will actually establish a state with institutions that are so in a sense, powerful, that despite the fact that one of his half-brothers will assassinate him and he will die, his powerful state will continue. And in a sense, that is a sign of someone who has built a good system, a stable institution, and that it can survive the death of the founder. Right, so Shaka Zulu created a government and a military so powerful and so stable that it was able to survive even after he was gone. Now, the British will invade uh, his territory, which is controlled by his descendants, in 1879. But a modern British military, armed with powerful rifles and even rockets, will be defeated by the Zulus at the Battle of Isandwana. Right? And I'll talk a little bit shortly about how the Zulus are able to win that battle. But I do want to highlight that Africans, even when they were armed just with spears and shields, were capable of defeating an industrially based modern Western army. And the Zulus did pull that off. And th what happens, though, is that the Zulus will lose the war because the British is powerful industrial economy will allow them to do so. But the key thing I just want to point out here is that the Zulus were not walkovers. They were building a powerful highly developed uh, state 
uh, an army that was capable of defeating a modern industrial power, it's probably the greatest industrial power in this time period, uh, their army. Even though, like I said, the British will eventually win the war. So I mentioned that Shaka was a uh, great military leader. He engaged in military reforms that allowed him to go out and conquer and build up a state. And part of his military reforms were related to the weapons used by the Zulus. Uh, in, his, in his area of Africa, people traditionally fought using longer spears that they would either throw or stab with. What he did was he kept the throwing spear. Uh, he kept using long spears to throw, but he also developed a shorter stabbing spear, which could be used up close. Right, and you can kind of think about it this way: you don't, if you you can't really stab someone quickly with a long spear, you can't get enough force behind it to really do much. And just trying to, you know, if you just move your hand along it to make it shorter, you still have that long thing in the back that you're having to deal with, uh, very clumsy. So he developed a, so he would have his warriors throw long spears and then close to fight the enemy with short spears, which were lighter and easier to use, and therefore more effective. He also developed military tactics based around um, cattle. Uh, and this is important. The Zulus measured wealth in cattle. Um, they had lots of cattle. And, and uh, so when he envisioned his warriors, he thought about them in terms of cattle. And what he did was he divided warriors by age and he, into units that were labeled based on the parts of a cow. So, for example, he put his older, more experienced warriors in the chest. And those were the guys who would attack the enemy first. And then he had a group of people, his oldest warriors, who were maybe a little bit past their prime. These would be the reserves, and they were called the loins, because they're in the back. So what would happen is, he would have the chest, the older, more experienced warriors, the bravest guys who are, who are also tempered with experience, they would attack the enemy straight up in the front line. The enemy would then probably strengthen the front line, taking uh, soldiers away from the sides, what are called the flanks. And then the younger warriors who were brave but inexperienced, would circle around the enemy in the shape of horns. Right, They would go around the enemy in the shape of horns. And um, they would then attack the enemy who was now weaker because uh, on the sides because they had strengthened their center. And if anyone needed help, the uh, loins, the reserves, could be deployed. And Shaka supposedly would even have the loins face away from the battle so they wouldn't get antsy and just attack anyway. And the thing about this system is this is really amazing. It's, it's a good strategy. It allows you to surround your enemy and deal a lot of damage with them, to them. It makes sure that you use different people in the best area. So your younger warriors who are brave but don't aren't as experienced, okay, they've got a job. They're not going to make initial contact. The older, more experienced warriors can do that. And everyone knows what they're supposed to do. Right? It's hard on the battlefield to like organize people because people are like fighting and shouting and yelling and stuff. It's nice when you go into a battle and everyone knows what they're supposed to do. Okay, I'm in the chest. I'm going to attack the front. I'm in the loins, the reserves. I'm going to go around the side. And this strategy is going to be very effective and going to allow him to conquer lots and lots of territory and actually build a state. And if you look at this map, this is the map for the Battle of Isandwana, the battle that uh, the Zulus, not led by Shaka, he's dead by this time, but um, it will be his tactics that will defeat the British. And you can see the Zulus are represented there by the darker arrows in the north, the east, and the west. They're going to use these exact same tactics against the British. The British in this battle did not um, fortify properly, so they're, they're not going to be able to um, shoot down the uh, Zulus as they charge, right? So the Zulus, using this strategy, are going to be actually able to close with the British, who did not fortify properly in this battle, and actually engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the British. And as you might guess, the Zulus, when it comes to hand-to-hand -hand combat, are going to have the advantage. That's what they concentrate on. And uh, a rifle with a bayonet is not a bad weapon, but an experienced warrior with a shield and spear is going to do better th um, than a man with a bayonet. Right, just in general, he's going to be better trained, and those are better weapons up close. Right, a rifle is, you know, its secondary purpose is to be used as a bay uh, with a bayonet, not its primary purpose. But a spear is primary purpose is stabbing someone up close, so it's designed for that. So because of these tactics, right, the uh, Zulus are able to close with the British, who, like I said, did not. Uh, the British make some mistakes and do not fortify properly, so they're not able to use their guns to the effect that they should be used. And the Zulus are able to close and defeat them and win this battle. And one thing I, I really want to, to emphasize about this, right, is that you, so you've got here these Africans, even though these Zulus have, you know, fairly primitive technology, right? It's just, it's spears and shields. 
they're smart enough, they're organized enough, they're disciplined enough that they're able to mobilize a large force and use these uh, well-developed tactics to defeat a modern, Western, technologically advanced army. Right, So we can't look at this and say, well, geez, Africans are inferior to uh, Europeans. I don't see how this is inferior. Uh, these Africans here, the Zulus, are doing quite well considering the fact that they are still, at, they have this low level of uh, technology. Right, So there's nothing inferior about them. They just don't have the tech. So to give you one more test case, um, I want to talk to you about the Battle of Adwa. And this is important because even though this is only like a single battle, when the Ethiopians win this battle, they win it so well, they actually win the war. Uh, this battle was fought when Italy invaded Ethiopia in 1896. And the Ethiopians will win this battle, will defeat the Italians. Uh, and they do this, like I said, in such a spectacular way that, that it wins them the war. Now, why do they win? Now, first of all, they outnumber the uh, Italians four to one. That is an advantage. Right When you outnumber your enemy, they're fighting in Africa. They're going to have more soldiers, so that's fine. But what other thing I want to emphasize is the Ethiopians also had some modern weapons. They had some rifles, and they used them correctly. The Ethiopians were able to not only fire these weapons, um, you know, they knew how to shoot guns. They also knew how to deploy them militarily in an effective way. Right. So my key point here is that Africans were capable of using advanced technology. Right? We just talked about how the Zulus are defeated um, in the war because they lacked industrial technology, even though they win the Battle of the Sondwana. Well, you could say, well, Africans are, are inferior because they don't have modern weapons. Well, here you can see Africans using modern weapons. So Africans were quite capable, not only of the physical act of firing a gun accurately, but of using them strategically in a battle. In addition, Ethiopia was an old state with a long history. Um, if you took History 121 with me... Um, then we talked a lot about Ethiopia, but Ethiopia is fascinating because they've had a king for like over a thousand years by this time period. So they're a very ancient state with a long history. People fair, felt a lot of loyalty to their king. Ethiopia is one of the oldest Christian countries in the world. And they actually believe that their king was descended from uh, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. They identified Sheba from the Bible as Ethiopia. And you may know that the, there's a story of the Queen of Sheba meeting Solomon in the Bible. That's where they... they uh, draw their royal line from. They say that their king is the descendant of Solomon and Queen of Sheba. And of course, you know, that's the house of David, right? That's kind of a big deal. Um, and this helped to give them a sense of loyalty to their king. So they're willing to fight hard for their king um, and they're armed with modern weapons and use those properly, right? So again, you can see here, Africans are quite able to fight effectively and win, especially when they have access to modern weapons. Now, Ethiopia is eventually colonized, um, later on, uh, about 40 years later, but only uh, by Italy, but primarily because of the increased technology gap. In that war with Italy, the Italians had bombers and they used poison gas against the Ethiopians and the Ethiopians were not ready for that kind of warfare. Um, and I mean, who would be? I mean, poison gas is pretty nasty stuff. So Africans did not lose wars or battles or become colonized because they were racially inferior to Europeans but because they lacked the necessary historical conditions to undergo, in particular, the scientific and industrial revolutions, right? Had they been able to do that, things would have been likely different. And you may say, well, doesn't that mean that their civilization is inferior because they didn't have those things? Well, remember, it was, in a sense, historical contingency, or in a sense, good luck, that gave Europeans the factors that gave birth to the scientific and industrial revolutions. No European sat down and said, let's have a scientific revolution or let's have an industrial revolution. Rather, there were differing factors that led them to have those things. And especially in the case of the industrial revolution, that could only happen if you remember, I gave you six characteristics that were necessary for that to happen. And there were actually more than that. I just focused on those six because I think that they were the most important. But if you lacked any one of those, it wouldn't happen. And the only place in the world that it had those six characteristics exactly at this time period was basically England. And the English didn't plan it. It just, they had it and it all came together. So that's what we call, again, historical contingency. It's not, in a sense, saying that, well, this group of people were superior. That's why they, they became so powerful. There's a lot more to it than that. Right? We're, we're shaped, in a sense, by our environment, by our history, 
And even if someone has a lot of advantages, if they lack certain things, certain resources, something in their environment, they're not able to actualize or utilize those advantages as maybe they would. So again, it's this the fact that uh, Africa is going to become colonized doesn't have anything to do with being racially inferior, but because they lacked these necessary historical conditions to undergo the revolutions, particularly the scientific and industrial revolutions that we've been talking about. And lots of places lack that. And if you had those factors, a lot of times it was essentially because you had good luck. So in other words, it's historical contingency, not biology, that's going to shape African history. And the way you can kind of think about this, what if Shaka had been born in 1381 instead of 1781, right? What if he could have had this state have a few little, few hundred more years to develop, right? Uh, Shaka was, on, like I said, the Zulus, they were building this powerful, complex state. They were doing things that were happening and had happened in Europe and Asia and other places before. If they just had a few hundred years more to do that before the Europeans came, maybe things would have been different. Maybe they would have had the conditions to build up stronger, uh, to engage in those political and economic revolutions, maybe even a scientific and industrial revolution, right? Like I said, it, a lot of it's historical contingency. If Shaka had been born at a different time, had been able to do what he did then, maybe the history of Africa would have looked different. But because of historical contingency, he was not. He was born in a different time. And so his state is not going to have the same amount of time that others would have in order to develop the revolutions we've been talking about. So Europeans uh, have the technology. They have the industrial capacity. They have the ideology necessary to justify the conquest of Africa and to conquer uh, much of it. And there's going to be this kind of what we call scramble for Africa. All these different uh, European countries, uh, particularly France, Germany, and Great Britain, are going to be competing over different parts of Africa. And there's actually concern in Europe that conflict over Africa might actually lead to war, right? There's this concern in Europe, and Europe in the 1880s, uh, especially Central and Western Europe, has actually enjoyed uh, a good amount of peace. And the wars that have been fought were relatively short. Uh, so there's this fear that they might have another war. It might be a bigger war because of competition over Africa. So what happens is in the years 1884 to 1885, uh, a number of Europeans and representatives, representatives of the Ottoman Empire will actually meet in Berlin in order to divide up Africa, right? Um, so they're not actually inviting any Africans when they divide up Africa and they, they just get together and they basically have some maps of Africa and they say, okay, you get this bit, we get this bit and so forth. And this way they kind of agreed to this division. And the problem is with this is it looks okay on paper. It's like, okay, this river runs here. That makes a good border between your colony and my colony. Um, the problem is that river might split an ethnic group. There might be a particular group of Africans who live on um, the same, uh, live along that river and now you split them in two. And some of them are going to be ruled by Germany and some of them are going to be ruled by France. And that's one reason why there's going to be divisions and problems later when these countries become independent. Because one country, you know, um, remember nationalism, each nation should have its own state. You're going to have these nations, these ethnic groups split between different states. And that's a recipe for war. So it's a problem, right? These, uh, these things may look good on paper, but on the ground, there is a problem. And like I said, Africans themselves are not being consulted about this. The Ottoman Empire is only there not because it gets to keep a lot of Africa, but because it had possessions in Northern Africa. And um, according to international law, basically the Europeans just wanted to make sure that the Ottomans said, okay, yeah, you can have these, these parts of North Africa. The only two countries in this time period to escape colonization, uh, the first was Liberia, because it was a colony that was established for freed slaves. Uh, one problem the British had was that they would uh, rescue slaves who were on an illegal slave ship. And then, of course, the, the slaves would not uh, they'd be freed, but they weren't exactly sure how to get home and they would be allowed then to settle in this colony. And that's why it's called Liberia. It sounds a little bit like Liberty, right? That's the idea. And uh, Liberia had a close relationship with Britain and was protected by treaties with Britain. So no one was going to invade it because it would mean having to fight Britain. And then Ethiopia, as we already described, was able under its own power to maintain its independence during this time period. So as Europeans colonized Africa, they had to try and figure out how they were actually going to govern this territory. For example, do you rule it directly? Uh, do you actually put British or German or French officials in there into different parts of Africa 
uh, to rule directly? Or do you rule through traditional rulers? And these both have advantages and disadvantages. Ruling directly is really expensive. It gives you a lot of power, a lot of authority because you're there. But it's expensive because you have to send these Europeans all throughout uh, Africa. A lot of Europeans, the problem is they don't speak African languages, so it makes it hard for them to govern. Um, but there is an effort at times to have, especially in the high positions, to have direct rule by high uh, European officials. Ruling through traditional rulers is cheaper, right? You just uh, tell them what to do, and then they theoretically will do it for you. However, the problem with that is it makes it more difficult to actually make sure that they're doing what you want to do because they may just ignore your instructions or pretend to go along or whatever. And this is also related to this question. Do you accept things as they are or do you try and civilize and uh, make Africans like Europeans? Uh, another word used in this time period was assimilation. You know, do you rule them directly and try and make them act like Europeans? Um, or do you rule the Africans through their traditional rulers and then you... Um, uh, just let them kind of keep doing things the way they are. And if your major goal is just to make money, a lot of times you're just like, yeah, we'll just rule indirectly through it, traditional rulers because then we can just tax them and uh, it's expensive to try and change them and to rule directly. So we'll just do it that way. Um, ruling uh, directly though and trying to civilize or assimilate, that was oftentimes areas that were considered the most important. You would say, okay, this, this colony is particularly important to us. We want to keep it for a very long time. So we need to make the people be like us and we need to make them uh, an integral part of our civilization so there's this kind of this is kind of this, this issue right these are basic questions that empires have to decide do we rule directly do we rule through traditional rulers do we uh, do we try and change things if so how much do we try and change now to give you one example uh, because i'm talking a lot about the uh, british i want to talk about france briefly uh, france had a colony called senegal which is in western africa and there they chose direct rule and assimilation, right? They said, okay, we're going to have French officials ruling this directly. And we expect the Senegalese, the people of Senegal to become French in terms of culture, in terms of civilization, right? That was kind of the basic idea. Now, what's fascinating about this, right? Uh, and remember, we're trying to kind of understand how people, how African people tried to deal with imperialism. We talked about resistance, right? We talked about the Zulus. We talked about the uh, Ethiopians, how they resisted. Now we're talking a little bit more um, about how they might try and work with the empire. So I want to give you an example of this man here on the right, Blaise Diagna. Blaise Diagna uh, is going to try and assimilate. He will learn French. He will uh, adopt French culture and French civilization. And what's interesting then is, and this is, you know, I have to give credit to the French. For Africans who actually did this, they could get French citizenship and could actually serve in the government. So Blaise Diagna would eventually be recognized as a French citizen because he learned French and had adopted French culture. And he would then serve in uh, Senegal as a uh, member of basically the Senegal local administration as, as one of their elected members of their legislature who would make laws and things like that. But what's really striking to me in particular is that he would be brought into the French uh, parliament. He would actually, uh, Senegal would get seats in the French parliament, what's called the National Assembly. And he would serve there from 1914 to 1934. You can see, that, I mean, that's 20 years he was serving in basically the French Congress. And uh, the only reason he stopped serving was because he died. And what's striking to me about this, right, is that he's part of the French National Assembly. That means he's helping to make laws that govern French people, right? He's going to help go make, govern, uh, make laws that govern French people. In other words, a black African man is helping to pass laws that are going to govern white French people. So the French were, to a certain degree, serious about this whole idea of civilization and assimilation. And Blaise Diagna is complicated because he does support the French, what they would call mission of civilization, right? He thinks France is admirable. He, uh, he wants Africa to become more like France, but he doesn't think Africans should cease being Africans. And he doesn't just say, hey, I'm, I'm working for France. He also tried to use his position to negotiate better terms for Africans, right? So he tried to promote the interests of Africans when dealing with the French in the French parliament. So he doesn't forget he's an African, right? So he's someone who's willing to accept 
French rule who's willing to work with the French because he really does admire French civilization and thinks it can make Africa better. But at the same time, he doesn't forget he's an African. He's still trying to help benefit uh, other Africans. Now, one thing I want to point out, though, of course, is while you had Blaise Diagna, other Africans, of course, would resist. Some would say, you know, why should we change? Why should we change? You know, we like uh, our culture. We like our traditional civilization. We want to keep things the way that they are. And even some who said, you know, we do admire French civilization or we admire French culture or British culture. You know, we admire you. We'd like to borrow some of your stuff, but we want to be free. We want to be independent. Right. And you can think about the Americans, right? We borrowed a lot of our culture from England, of course, but that didn't stop us from wanting to be independent and run things our own way. So you could also have Africans who admired and wanted to selectively adopt from Western civilization, but who would want to be free, who would want to maintain their independence. Now, I'm going to give you an extreme example because I think it makes things the most clear of why Africans might want to maintain their independence even when they were faced with, you know, these advanced civilizations, these advanced cultures from which they could borrow and develop a uh, further develop their own civilization, their own culture. And to do that, I'm going to talk about the Belgian Congo, right? I'm going to talk about the Belgian Congo. And this map just shows us where the Belgian Congo is. And you'll notice it's kind of an odd shaped um, colony. It was a colony. And um, because of it, it's got this little part sticking into the ocean. And the idea of this is that you can uh, then gather natural resources from the inner part and then gain access to a port so you can export them, right? That's why it has this really uh, kind of curious shape is so you can extract resources from the center and then bring them to a port where they can then go to Europe. That's why it's shaped like that. And I want to point out too, this is a colony of Belgium, which is a primarily uh, French speaking country, fairly small in uh, Europe borders on France, but even Belgium, a relatively small country, is going to have a pretty big chunk of, of uh, territory. <clears throat> the resource that Belgium wanted, or I should say King Leopold, uh, he was the king of Belgium and was the one that was really behind this effort. The resource that they wanted to extract and then export to Europe was rubber, right? We had talked earlier about how rubber was extremely important, especially after the development of vulcanization, which made it stronger. You can use it in all sorts of machines. Of course, it's absolutely necessary for cars and uh, any kind of industrial economy is going to need rubber and lots of it. Very useful material. And the Congo was a particularly attractive place for obtaining rubber. Now, one thing I have to stress though, and you can see this on the left, um, is that the harvesting of rubber, it comes from trees, it comes from rubber trees, and it's basically a kind of sap that you have to harvest. It is really hard to harvest, right? It is actually very difficult to harvest rubber. And the people who lived in the Congo around the rubber were not particularly interested in harvesting it. Uh, they were people who had a, um, what can I say, in many ways, a fairly uh, simple culture. They lived in little villages, typically, uh, were basically kind of at a tribal level of organization, and their basic needs were taken care of, right? Um, I haven't talked a lot about this class. I talk about my other History 121 uh, World Civilizations class. You know, that um, you can be oftentimes people who are at very low levels of technology are actually happier than people at high levels of technology. Uh, for example, among Stone Age peoples, and there's still people who primarily use like Stone Age technology today, the suicide rate is almost unheard of. Right. So people in, in early societies, uh, what we may call primitive, and I don't use that as a I just mean that to mean early first, not to be uh, to make a value judgment, are often happier than people in more advanced civilizations and cultures. And if you, you can measure this in a sense by measuring suicide rates. Right. So people um, in Stone Age cultures typically had very low or non-existent su suicide rates. So you had uh, African people living in the Congo who had. Um, you know, like I say, maybe a low level of technology lived in a kind of a political so, uh, society that was not, uh, that was at a very early, fairly simple stage and their needs were basically taken care of. They didn't really want a lot of things from the outside. Uh, tapping rubber was very hard work and they didn't want to do it because they didn't really see a need to, um, because their needs were basically met, right? So remember earlier, we talked about this problem of, uh, how slavery is a response often to a labor shortage. And people will also engage in slavery when there is a labor shortage and force other people to make up that labor shortage. You have a kind of similar situation here where you have people that exist 
and are capable of doing work, but are not interested in doing the work because it's very hard work and there's not really a reward for it. And of course, that's nothing against them. Why would you want to work hard when there's no reward for working hard, right? You know, if you're happy with your life, why would you want to stop and go do very hard, difficult, dangerous work? And uh, tapping rubber was very hard, difficult, dangerous work. So the way that um, King Leopold and the uh, his colonial administrators dealt with this problem was by um, forcing the people to harvest the rubber. And I, I mean forcing. They would go into a village and round up the women and children and take them prisoner and then tell the men, okay, you need to gather up uh, so many hundred pounds of rubber by tomorrow or we're going to start cutting off hands and feet. And you can see on the right, those are uh, children uh, who have had their uh, hands cut off because uh, the rubber quota was not being met, right? And I, I don't know what to call this. Um, it's not technically slavery because these people were not owned. It's terrible. Um, it's awful. It's, I don't, I, I like to kind of, it's kind of like a gangsterism. I don't know what to call it, but it's basically just telling these people, okay, go harvest stuff, go get this rubber, or else we're going to start inflicting terrible pain and suffering on you. And by the way, if, if cutting off the hands and feet of your, uh, your, your wives and your children is not enough, uh, we'll start killing them if you don't get the rubber. And um, several million people of the Congo, several million of these Congolese Africans uh, will die uh, because of this, because the work itself is so hard and strenuous, or because they're just straight out murdered uh, by the Belgians and their uh, Belgians and their police. So here's the key thing, right, uh, that I want to emphasize. This is why you don't want to be someone's colony. This is an extreme example, but the principle is the same. When you're someone else's colony, they make you do stuff that maybe you don't want to do to benefit them, right? Remember again that image. The colonies are the maids, the servants who serve the mother country. The mother country gets to do what it wants. It gets to run its own affairs, but the colonies are run for, based around what is good for the mother country. This is an extreme example of this. This wasn't Europeans were not always doing things like this, but this example, I think, proves the point of why Africans, even if they might admire Western civilization and want to borrow from Western civilization, also would want to maintain their independence.